I'm one of your chairs for the afternoon. My name's Emma Helm. I'm a PhD student with Dr. Nick Gabler in the area of swine nutrition and physiology. And with my co-host, Kristen, we'll be kind of trying to keep things on track. So our first speaker today is Dr. Paul Yeski with the Swine Vet Center. Um, Dr. Yeski graduated from Iowa State University in 1985 with his DVM and followed up this education with a master's in swine medicine from the University of Minnesota in 1998 and received a certificate from the executive veterinary program at the University of Illinois in 2009. Uh, Dr. Yeski received the Science with Practice Awards from the 2013 Iowa State University James D. McKean Swine Disease Conference and also at the 2010 Lehman Conference. He was recognized as the Swine Practitioner of the Year in 1998 and the Howard Dunn Memorial Lecture in 1996, both with AASP. He is based in St. Peter, Minnesota with the Swine Vet Center as the Swine Veterinary Herd Health Consultant. And he will be talking today about lessons learned about the control of mycoplasma hyena Please join me in welcome, welcoming Dr. Yeski. Well, thanks for the opportunity to come and share some of our experiences, and hopefully if we can get the technology to work here, otherwise you're going to have kind of a boring talk here. But All right, there we go. Again, uh, from, from the topic today was mycoplasma, new things in mycoplasma and control, and certainly the things I'm going to share with you today are not from myself alone, but uh, from everyone that uh, at the Swine Vet Center uh, who help out with these projects along the way and uh, we're able to learn from each other. Again, <clears throat> what we're going to cover this afternoon is uh, some of the issues with mycoplasma, hyonomoniae, uh, some of the intentional exposure work that's been being done, and then we're going to talk about how to expose gilts, how to eliminate, and some of the success rates. We know that uh, mycoplasma has historically been uh, a disease in the industry. It's been around for a long time and uh, in the last few years certainly continued to be more of a headache and uh, reduces average daily gain, uh, causes poorer feed efficiency, increases medication cost. And when we look at it, uh, this is looking at a production system, looking at their records over about a seven year period, it was about $3.60 a head or about $100 a sow. So certainly has an impact to the to the bottom line of the, end of the uh, production system. When we go back and look at some of the basics we understand about mycoplasma, I think it's always good to go back and understand what do we really know. Uh, piglets are born without mycoplasma, uh, so that's one thing that's helpful. Uh, they do become colonized and they are susceptible at all ages once the pigs are born. And the dams are usually the source of the mycoplasma to the pigs and uh, the infection rate or the colonization rate that happens in farrowing has a direct impact on the performance in the grow finish and uh, that's the area where we're working to control so that we have less of the problems once we get out into the finishing phase. We also know that mycoplasma is shed for a long time from the animals that are positive upwards to that 240 days. Certainly not every animal sheds that long uh, but can be that long. <clears throat> Why has mycoplasma surfaced to be more of a problem uh, in the industry? And I think probably one of the biggest things was historically we had positive replacement animals and today we have uh, virtually all negative replacement animals. So we're bringing negative populations into positive populations and not always being effective in getting those animals acclimatized and producers think their mycoplasma system's positive and that the animals are going to enter the herd and they're going to get positive right away and so they don't check and they don't monitor and we get into these unstable situations. And uh, why, why haven't people done more monitoring? And again, one of the problems has been serologies. Um, it takes a long time for animals to turn positive so it's uh, frustrating and you can miss some things if you're looking with just serology and doing the other means of testing are more difficult. Uh, the oral fluids, uh, if you've got a positive oral fluids, you've really got a problem. And nasal swabs are poor sampling. The tracheal bronchial swabs are probably the best long-term sampling method, but they're also the most difficult to do and uh, require a little bit more training 
And not that anybody can't do them, it just takes a little bit more time and effort. <clears throat> so the gilts, and really the problem with mycoplasma is in getting the gilts exposed coming into the herd. And this is some of Rojos' work where, again, demonstrating the difficult nature of this bug to spread. Uh, it took six contact animals to get four animals positive. And so any, to do that in a 30-day period. And so when we talk about having cedar animals in a gilt population, it's just going to be pretty tough to make that happen with those kind of numbers and have enough room. And so really the challenge for us is here today, and again, if you take nothing else home from this talk, this is a slide you should remember, uh, is today we have the negative animals that are entering most of our herds. So we have mycoplasma negative animals. And what we want to do is we want to wean essentially negative pigs or we want to wean pigs that have very low incidence of mycoplasma because then we're going to have less clinical signs and the grow finish. The problem is that animals can shed up to 240 days. There's a long shedding period. So if we're going to beat that shedding period, we beat these negative animals, turn them positive, and we want to have negative pigs, we got to work backwards that gestation length and then we have to add 126 days to it. So essentially we have to get those pigs, those gilts positive by the time they're 84 days of age. And so that becomes the challenge. And it's depicted by Peters and Fano here where we got the negative small pigs, they turn positive and then they go back to where they're very low shedding to their offspring. And so uh, that's what we're trying to get done. That's what we're trying to accomplish. I think that's one of the key learnings from mycoplasma control. And we talked a little bit about the economics, and uh, I'm sorry these get small, but uh, again, we know there's a significant impact on average daily gain, feed efficiency, uh, again, the green bars being the negative, and so the yellow bars being just mycoplasma. And we know there's more mortality, we know there's more cost in uh, treatments, uh, whether feed grade or just additional injection. So again, uh, costing a lot of money on the grow finish side. And one of the questions has always been, do we see more infection pressure coming from the farm itself or from lateral transmission? And so one of the studies I'd wanted to do for a long time was this lateral transmission study where we looked at negative pigs being placed in pig dense areas to see what the true incidence rate was and then if we could identify some of the risk factors uh, that related to uh, the herds becoming positive for mycoplasma. So we identified these finishing sites and they were predominantly in uh, southern Minnesota and northwest Iowa. Uh, it gets a little small on the screen here, but all those dots are pig farms. And so we went into the pig dense areas. We wanted farms that were uh, run on an all in, all out by site basis washed and disinfected and we picked 50 sites and we did a group that was marketed in the summer fall and in the winter spring so we could look and see if there was any seasonality to it and uh, any differences there based upon when the pigs were born or when the pigs were marketed. Again what we did was we tested the pigs at the end of the finishing phase just to get an answer of yes or no. Uh, did these negative pigs that we knew were negative placed in pig dense areas turned positive. So we tested 30 serum samples at the end of the group uh, right before the time of marketing. And then we had a questionnaire uh, for risk factors and we uh, put together the production data for these farms as well. We uh, set out to have 100 sites. We actually ended up with 105 sites. And again, for those of you that have done field research, we ended up with five sites that got marketed before we could go back and get a retest done so we don't really know the status of five of those sites so we did some additional sites. We did five different production systems so it wasn't just in one production system uh, and we took 10 sites from each of those systems so we had 20 different sites from the five production systems. So what did we learn? Uh, out of all these hundred sites we only had six sites that turned positive so again the lateral transmission occurs, it just doesn't occur very frequently. And when we looked at how we identified them, we saw one with serology, so they got uh, infected early enough that they tested positive. The others we identified with laryngeal swabs uh, because we got some, uh, a small number turning positive when we went in and did the testing. 
So again, uh, all the positive, the interesting thing was uh, when we went back and looked at the data and reviewed the numbers, is all the sites that were positive also had clinical signs of coughing. So again, the coughing index is probably still a pretty good diagnostic for mycoplasma. So again, uh, what we learned was, uh, again, mycoplasma can go lateral infection. You can get it from the neighborhood, uh, but it just doesn't happen very often. Uh, Six percent is a pretty low incidence when we compare it, especially to PERS, uh, that's more of a 50 percent. So again, definitely different risks there. And most of these were late-term infections, so when we looked at the performance data, we didn't see as big of an impact on the performance data as if the pigs would have been positive and coming through the system as a positive pig. So there's less impact on the performance when the pigs get infected later on in age. <clears throat> the laryngeal swabs uh, can be a good way to um, validate the uh, unexpected positives on IDEX. We did get a few of those when we were doing the testing. And we can monitor vaccination, our vaccinated pigs. Again, it's very important to understand the vaccine that you're using and some of the limitations that may come with that. And clinical signs is still a good method to diagnose uh, mycoplasma. And uh, again, <clears throat> uh, we had that low, low transmission rate. And historically, that's been one of the biggest concerns by producers that want to go into elimination program is, gee, I go through the elimination, I may make negative pigs, but they'll just get reinfected when I put them in the finisher. Again, I think this should be one hurdle that's eliminated uh, from those discussions just because it does happen, just doesn't happen very frequently. And I think if you're having mycoplasma, the other lesson this taught me was if you're having mycoplasma problems in your finishing, it's probably the source farm that's the problem, not the neighborhood per se. And I think this is some information we can put into some of the decision models, some of the, as we're looking at the economic value of taking a herd negative or a system negative uh, to predict how reliable that's going to be if we go there. So again, for those of you that know me, I've done a lot of the eliminations and uh, uh, focused around that for a long time and continue to work on that. Uh, and the main reason was uh, the producers would always complain about the coughing pigs. And so I got tired of hearing about the coughing pigs, and so we said, let's work on trying to eliminate that. And it ended up costing more in performance and costing more in medication and all those things. So I worked with Daniel Linares to put together a budget on uh, looking at uh, doing an elimination program. And so we know there's some cost involved with doing elimination, such as if you do an offsite breeding project, the medication, whoops, the medication program, uh, vaccination, if there's production impact. And then, uh, again, you get more pigs per batch because of mortality. And uh, you're marketing more pigs. You can reduce some of the antibiotic use on the, on the plus sides. Uh, putting together the numbers and uh, modeling the, the outcomes based upon the database that I had uh, at the time, we used 86% success rate, and when we did the medication program, 58% success rate. And so a cost at about 20, Daniel's cost was about 22.14 or, or 30, uh, $33 a sow on the treatment side, and ended up being an economic benefit of $5 per uh, pig, and on a 5,000 sow, uh, turns out to be real dollars at the end of the day being over uh, $600,000 for an annual cost. So we take that and look at the investment of doing the elimination. Either we do the herd closure or the medication plan for elimination. Uh, it's either a three month to get a payback or an 11 month to get the payback. So again, uh, that's why a lot of producers, that's why a lot of our producers have gone into elimination programs is simply because the payback is fairly quick and uh, fairly repeatable. And so when we're talking about eliminations, when we do the herd closures, uh, most of these we piggyback on top of PERS closures uh, because we're already doing a PERS closure on the farm. We just have to add another 40 days to it. So we can uh, do two, kill two birds with one stone. Many of the south farms are going to filtration and adding filtration. And, um, and so it just makes sense to go ahead and take that next step 
uh, to uh, get rid of the myco into those situations. And to date yet, I don't know of a filtered farm that's re broken with uh, mycoplasma. And we've had some of the discussion this morning already about not raised with antibiotics, antibiotic-free production. Again, certainly the pressure to reduce antibiotics and a lot of the grow-finish antibiotics are, are uh, focused around mycoplasma control. So basically with the herd closure, uh, what we're doing is waiting for the sows to stop shedding. We have a population of animals we've exposed. We flow those through the units so we can maintain production, maintain flow, uh, not change the production of the herd, and then be able to bring in negative animals on the back end. The closure time, from the time we uh, confirm that the herd is positive, then we're using 240 days because of the shedding uh, that was done with uh, Peter's work uh, back a number of years ago. And just to give kind of a, a schematic of what that looks like, we do do the whole herd vaccinations just to reduce some of the pressure. And then we come in here with medication. Most of the time we've done water medication and then we're treating the piglets with like a Duraxin. And then sometimes we've done a feed grade after the water medication. And sometimes we've done off-site breeding projects. And so there's multiple ways to do it. We've done it a number of different ways successfully, a number of different antibiotics successfully. Uh, I think the keys are really the, the making sure the herd's positive first, and then uh, having the right amount of uh, having the 240-day time frame. We put together a checklist for the herds that go through it. And certainly, if you're thinking about it and you have some questions, uh, feel free to contact me. I'd be happy to uh, work, work through that with you and uh, understand what we've done. We did go through, uh, worked with uh, Dr. Maria Peters at the University of Minnesota, looking through some of the eliminations we did. And we did what we call a survival analysis, saying how a survival being herds that stayed negative over time. And so uh, in this database, the longest herd was 155 months, so over 14 years. So you can see that herds break down with the herd closure method, uh, but they don't break down very fast when we ended up at 81% of the herds uh, remaining, surviving or remaining negative. When we did the medication, the whole herd medication with no closure, you can see a lot of herds failed right away. But then once we got past that eight month time frame or the end of shedding, again, most of those herds continued to stay negative. And so when we looked at the survival, there was a statistical difference uh, with, uh, with the whole herd, with the herd closure and herd medication program. Uh, but if you look at just the survival number, 81%, again, uh, there's not many things we get to do on an everyday basis that's 80% successful. When we look at the herd medication, that's 63%, so certainly lower, uh, but still pretty good odds of being able to get it eliminated. <clears throat> so again, um, that's how we've done the eliminations. One of the key factors, and whether you're doing elimination or just stabilizing your herd, one of the things we have to do is to get the herd expo get the gilts exposed coming into the herd, and that's where we started doing this intentional mycoplasma exposure, and allows us to uh, get that proper gilt acclimatization and make sure the gilts aren't shedding by the time they go ahead and fare with their first piglets. And for herds that are going into an elimination program, it better allows us to establish that day zero time frame. And again, just working back through this timeline so we can get those animals exposed at an early enough age so that they have time to cool down and don't shed to their pigs. There's several different methods that have been used for uh, exposure. Historically, what we used, and uh, would have been used for a long time to control mycoplasma would just be natural contact or cedar pigs, whatever you want to call it, uh, trying to get those animals exposed. In research, they've done the intratracheal inoculation, and we've done that in some of the uh, herd elimination plans just to make sure everybody's exposed. And now we've started doing this aerosol exposure to uh, make sure that we're getting more animals, or we're getting all the animals exposed. So again, the cedar model, Again, the biggest piece of this is making sure you got the right animals. We've got to have animals that are shedding uh, to be effective. And from Rojos's work, it says we've got to have a lot of them uh, to make it happen in a short period of time. 
Generally, what we've done in the past is use animals from the previous group because they're likely to be shedding the most and then bringing those back to uh, reinfect the, the next group of gilts. And you really need to be bringing gilts in at the feeder pig stage versus the select weight stage. If you're bringing in select weights, there's really no way to get this accomplished uh, in enough time to not have carryover into the piglets. <clears throat> Again, the limitations to uh, the cedar pig model is what we've seen and some of the frustrations we've had with it is the infection dies out and all of a sudden you've got negative animals farrowing or animals that are breaking right at the time of farrowing and uh, again we start seeing those higher numbers come through the piglets and more problems downstream and farms that get the like I said the select weight animals you just don't have enough time. So uh, if we're going to do something different than just the cedar animal then we have to have some way to expose the animals and currently we don't have a real good method of doing that that's where we talk about having a lung homogenate we use a lung homogenate because mycoplasma is very difficult to grow and handle in the lab uh, so we use a lung homogenate and we just want to make sure that uh, we take it from the site what uh, from the herd that we're going to be exposing and we leave it on site because we don't want to get contaminated with other pathogens along the way while we're acclimating to the uh, mycoplasma. We've gone in and done either the laryngeal or tra tracheal swabs to identify our uh, animals we'd harvest for the lung homogenate. Uh, in some instances we've treated with Exceed just to get rid of some of the strep, parasuus, asuus, some of those other bacterial organisms that we may not necessarily uh, want to be increasing the numbers on. Uh, early on we started just taking the affected areas of the lung, Rebecca Robbins did some work uh, looking at using the whole lung homogenate and we've gone to using the whole lung homogenate today uh, because the CT values are really the same in all areas of the lung even though there aren't necessarily lesions there. Uh, so it allows you to get more homogenate from each pig that you uh, go ahead and sacrifice. And so uh, again, uh, I don't have a Ninja Blender business but um, if you're going to do it, I would suggest the Ninja Blender. It works really the best that I've seen for making a very good homogenate. And uh, we put about 60% lung and 40% of the frisk media. If you want to do this or more information on it, get in contact with me. I can help you in uh, how you do the exposure. And then whether you're doing the intertracheal or whether you're doing the aerosol, uh, we do a little different things for how we uh, would um, how we would dilute that out. And we've, uh, one of the things we found was that the pantyhose work the best to filter the product so you can get it to flow through what you need to. Again, um, historically, uh, this method was used for research infection models to do the research projects to ensure that the animals were infected. And so it's an effective way of starting the colonization and infection process. Uh, the limitations are it's very labor intense and uh, the pigs aren't very excited about it either. It's dangerous to the staff, uh, requires a high degree of restraint and uh, uh, one of the things, ha having done some of these myself, uh, when you get about half of the, the, the inoculum down the trachea, the, the gilts think they're drowning and so then they start to shake their head and if you've ever uh, snared pigs or shaking their head, it's really fun. So again, you need good restraint, a good, uh, good catch with the snare, and then we use the mouth speculum. We use the laryngoscope so we can see uh, down to the uh, trachea. And a headlamp really helps to have uh, the light focused where you want it. And here you can see the catheter uh, as we're, uh, <clears throat> you have to wait for the pig to take a breath uh, for the larynx to open up and then you can pass it on through uh, on through into the trachea. Again, what you see is you get about halfway through and the pigs just twist their head and so you gotta be careful uh, that uh, they don't get away. It's not very much fun. Uh, <clears throat> so monitoring uh, the infection post exposure, how do you make sure you're successful? Uh, again, the laryngeal swabs, what we've seen is it takes about three to six weeks. Some of them will show up uh, a little bit quicker, but generally it's 
closer to that six week time frame before we start seeing them show up as positive. And then the serology uh, takes about eight, six to eight weeks to show up as the animals are positive. So there is some time uh, before we get there. The aerosol exposure is something we started about a year ago, uh, about a year ago, March actually. And uh, really it's become a lot more popular because it's a lot uh, more friendly from the labor side and from the pig side both. Again, we just use a hurricane fogger, prepare the lung homogenate, and then just uh, fog, it into, uh, fog it into the air. And uh, what we've done is somewhere, the early ones we did 30 minutes, we've been more probably in the 20 minutes here more recently, and then we try and leave the fans off for an extended period of time after that, as long as the temperature isn't rising too much. Uh, and in some of these instances, we've tried to find a small airspace, so you've got less area to fog. Uh, again, the nursery rooms have worked good because that's already a small airspace. Some people have used loadout rooms so they can put the animals in there, have less, um, less airspace. Load loading chutes, we've had some clients use loading chutes because, again, it makes for a smaller airspace. So they have a covered loading chute. You can run the animals out there and then just crowding them up into a smaller room if you have a smaller room on the site. Again, we've shut down the ventilation an additional, ideally 30 minutes, but we watched and monitor the temperature uh, to start up the ventilation uh, once we start to see the temperature rising. And uh, we did go through and collect some uh, positive air samples when we were fogging, and what we found was we went into a barn that was clinically affected with coughing pigs with mycoplasma, and we also went into the barns we were fogging and came back with very similar CT values. So it looks like we're seeing about the same thing the pigs would see naturally. And I worked with a couple of different production systems on trying this method. And uh, they started out doing some of the younger pigs and some at three weeks, some at seven weeks of age. And um, what we saw was that uh, we were getting those pigs anywhere from 80 to 100% positive four to five weeks post-exposure and uh, would start to see clinical signs uh, showing up there at three to four weeks and then at six to eight weeks seeing uh, for sure uh, definite clinical signs uh, in that particular example. And the other system uh, had a little bit bigger groups here. Again, uh, had two rooms of 400 head and you can see at two weeks, 95% of the pigs were positive uh, using tracheal swabs uh, at uh, four weeks, 98%, seven weeks, 100%. So again, uh, the pig's turning positive faster so you can establish your uh, time frame to allow the animals to start cooling down. And this was the second group they ran through. Again, at two weeks, they had 85%. Here at four weeks, they had 100%. So uh, the system seems to be working well. The questions we still have is, uh, like I say, we've been doing it for a relatively short period of time, is what's the right dose of homogenate? Uh, we kind of made a guess when we started putting the homogenate in there. Uh, it seems to be working. And uh, is there a specific concentration we need to achieve in the air? Uh, don't know. Uh, do you really need the confined space? Today we're doing larger air spaces. Seems to be working as well. So I don't know if we really need to find that confined space. And could it be done with culture? Uh, we tried a couple times, uh, again, but uh, uh, the difficulty in getting the cultures done is a part of the limitation there as well. And so, again, mycoplasma is still an important problem for the industry. And um, we need to, if we're going to leave the system be positive, we need to come up with a good way of uh, uh, intentionally exposing the gilts. And this method looks to be working well or when we're using it to establish the time zero uh, for doing an elimination program. And uh, certainly the help from BI and funding a lot of the diagnostics for this, the Maria Peters in some of the thought processes going into the homogenate, et cetera, and uh, uh, Christine and Elise for uh, helping uh, to uh, have their herds to do the project in, and some of our clients as well. Again, uh, after doing the gilts here for a while and having the success with the gilts this spring, we decided to try a sow herd that had broken and we were going to do an elimination to establish that time zero. 
Again, we had frozen up our uh, inoculum, and uh, we used the, the Frisk media and the lung homogenate and prepared that. Uh, and here you can see filtering the product, so we got all the cartilage out of there so we could fog it. And then uh, filled up the foggers. In this particular instance, we tried to fog for about 20 minutes because that's the capacity of the fogger, and we didn't want to have to refill them. Uh, we had the foggers ready to go in the G-Barn and set them up. We used the, uh, uh, the heater receptacles uh, because we were turning off the ventilation. We didn't have to have heat. And so we uh, plugged into the heater receptacles and used those as a power source. And that's something we could turn on from outside the room as well. And here's a picture of the fog. Fog in the barn, you can see uh, the mist uh, moving across. And then uh, you can see what it looked like. We, we wore uh, safety glasses, respirator, earplugs, because it did get kind of loud in there with all those foggers running. And uh, we did do some environmental testing, similar to what they'd done with PERS, uh, where we just did uh, uh, the uh, foil down and did the Swiffer testing. In one barn, we were three out of six. In the other barn, we were four out of four. And so again, uh, seeing it does appear that we're getting that homogenate pretty well out in the room. And these were a long distance away from, about as far away from the foggers as we could get. So. In summary of uh, the new things, again, that's some of the newest things we've been doing. Uh, mycoplasma is still a problem for the industry, uh, particularly because of the, the gilt status coming into our herds and making sure we've got a good exposure plan in the GDU at an early age uh, so those animals can stop shedding by the time they're farrowing. Whether you do the intratracheal or the fogging method, uh, I'd say there's a lot more people wanting to do the fogging method just because it's much more labor friendly. And the track record has been really good so far. Uh, again, it gives us enough time to develop the immunity and stop the shedding. And again, whether we're stabilizing the herd to keep the herd positive or looking for uh, that day zero for elimination. Uh, the finishers, we also know that we can keep finishers negative in a pig dense area and we've been able to see a good return on our investment. And uh, uh, as far as the aerosol exposure, uh, now we have a labor-friendly system that we can use uh, to expose these animals. Uh, I would say it's still very crude, and I'm uh, first to admit that, but it does work. Uh, we need to get some more research done to understand really what needs to be done as far as determining the right dose, and uh, can it be done from culture versus homogenate? And uh, uh, for those of you who have influence with some of the research dollars out there, if you could support some more research in this area, it would be very helpful uh, to understand and be able to do a better job. So in summary, uh, I think mycoplasma control, mycoplasma elimination certainly is possible, and we do have some new tools and procedures that can help us in the process. Any questions? Yep. I got two questions for you. The first one on the that you said on that finishing study, you looked at there was more than three things I think you said with SP over one five. Yep. One five. What you think you go back to the radio spots, how often did you find MSF? How often did you tell Michael the radio spots when you found three times? Yep, it depended. Uh, the question was when we were monitoring that lateral transmission study, uh, we used for the cutoff on the blood test, we used one point five on the uh, IDEX test, if they were above 1.5, we called them positive. And if they were below 1.5 and we had more than three uh, samples, we went in and did laryngeal swabs on the site to make sure they were positive. We had about 30% of the sites uh, that we went in and tested uh, that uh, showed up with three or more uh, being positive. Um, we, chose, we chose three as a number just because uh, that was 10% of the samples that we had uh, being positive, we said there's since most since all the site all the sites we were testing were vaccinated, and it did depend upon which vaccine you're using to what you saw. If you're using a single dose, we saw a whole lot less um, a whole lot less cross reactivity seeing positive animals. If you're using two doses, uh, we saw a little bit more of that, and depended upon the company product you're using for vaccination.
Yep. When you get a farm of breaks of furs and you decide, you know, you have an activated guilt for my go up until that time and you decide to go and put the negative guilt guilt in and load that farm up, is that the type of situation you're describing? Yes. The situation you go through and do multiple uh, gestation barns or would you just go through the one with the most recent guilt entries or how do you um, the, the question question was on the uh, whole herd sow exposure. Uh, what we did was a herd that had uh, broken clinically, and so we weren't sure that every animal had been exposed in the herd, or like you say, an instance where you had a, a PERS closure and you're bringing negative animals in, you weren't sure the status of the animals would be another, uh, another reason to do it. Uh, we did it in this instance because we weren't sure every animal had been exposed. Uh, we had two G barns. We did each G barn separately, but we did do both G barns. We did not do the farrowing because I didn't want to expose the little pigs to that. And, um, and so we did do uh, both of those uh, as separate events because we didn't want to have that many foggers running at once. And so we did each airspace as an individual airspace. Any other questions for our speaker? Do you think Paul with the fogging in the G barns that you potentially Yeah, the question, question was uh, with fogging the gestation barns, were we able to reduce the time frame of the herd closure? And uh, what we did was we went back at uh, two weeks and four weeks later. Uh, at four weeks later, we had essentially all the animals positive. And so again, we were able to establish our time zero, uh, where in the past, oftentimes we were guessing at time zero, we really didn't know. And uh, this gave us a little bit better feel that we had the right time for time zero. And so, yes, I think it can shorten the total length of that exposure phase before you enter the true closure. After elimination, you still use vaccine. Yep, the question was after we've gone through the elimination, and as you saw in that database, all those pigs are vaccinated because they're going in pig dense areas. And the vaccines are relatively inexpensive. Um, the vaccines um, are usually in combo products, so it doesn't require an extra vaccination. So yes, we've been vaccinating. Uh, with the data today, I'm not so sure it's as important as I once thought. Uh, I thought actually the rate would be a little bit higher. I didn't think it'd be very high, but I thought it might be a little bit higher. But I'd say a lot of people are still continuing to vaccinate just to have a safety net. All right, if there are no more questions, please join me in thanking our speaker.